so good to see you in prayer service this morning. Come on. We invite you to stand to your feet. Let's sing this song together. It's a song that you're very familiar with. Come on, sing it out. Yeah. Christ is my firm foundation.
Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Let's open our hearts a little bit this morning as we open our prayer meeting. Welcome every one of you to prayer meeting today. I want to share with you some thoughts. You know, there are times that meditations just go around in your heart and life, and I've been meditating recently, and I want to talk to you about the spoken word. You know, we don't really put value as we should in words. Can I take you back to the fact that in the beginning, God created the earth by the spoken word. He said, let there be light. And there was, and creation was formed. In Matthew chapter eight, verses eight through 10, the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. And I say to this servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. This man understood something about the word that Jesus would speak with the authority that he had. And he understood something about authority because he said, I'm a man under authority. And he said, I understand that, you know, there's a whole thought in this. I understand that you're a person of great authority and you just speak the word and it will be done. It was that word that Jesus gave to the enemy when he came to tempt him. Because when he came to tempt him on the Mount of Temptation to turn stones into bread, Jesus spoke the word. It is written. Man is to live by every word God speaks. And then again, the devil tempted him and he said, you know, he said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. And then he quotes the scripture to him. I think that's interesting. You gotta know that the devil understands the scripture. He's read the last chapter of the book. That's why he's so angry today. He's read it. But he said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. It is written, he has told his angels to take charge of you in the, in, and they will hold you up in their hands lest you dash your foot against the stone. It is written, Jesus said, you must not tempt the Lord your God. And then he got away and, you know, and he took him and he said, get away, Satan, it is written, you must worship God, the Lord your God, and obey him only. With authority, Jesus spoke the word. Why did he have authority? Because from the youngest age, he had learned the, the, the word totally. We know at about 12 years of age, he's in the temple discussing this with the scholars and they're amazed at what he understands and knows. Paul the Apostle understood something about the spoken word because he said in Romans 8, or Romans 10, 8 through 10, he said, the word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So there's a dual action here. There's the action of uh, believing, and believing is not just a head knowledge. I'm gonna talk about that for a second. Believing is, comes from right here, and then it's speaking. Paul again proclaims in Ephesians 6, he says, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now Paul understood the word, and he understood the authority that he had. Can I remind you to a young girl that was there crying out and, and disturbing his meetings one day, he turned around and he rebuked the devil in her and, she, and the devil left. That was it immediately. Can I remind you someone else in the book of Acts tried to use the same authority. And I love the fact the devil said to him or the, 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 the evil spirit said to him, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? There's a significance about the fact of understanding the authority that you have in the word. You see, you have the most powerful tool in your life, and I want to apply this to prayer in just a second. God wants us to memorize the word. He doesn't want it to become a mantra. 
I've heard people use the word of God as a mantra. Something bad happens, well, you know, all things work together for good to those that love God. After a while, I wanna go, oh, shut up. <laughs> Can I be very honest? It's like, you don't even know what you're saying. It's just rolling off your tongue like a mantra. He wants you to come to a soul conviction. He wants you to come to knowing it down in your gut that it's there. Use the word of God properly. You must be God-centered. You are actively wanting God's will. You're actively wanting God's purpose. You're actively wanting God's plan. Not your purpose, not your plan, but God's. That's what Jesus said when he was in the garden. Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He could have stopped that, that whole scenario there by his own desire, but he brought himself to submit to, the, to God. John 15, as we're studying in that, in that portion of scripture, if you abide in me and my words abide, dwell, live in you. Now I challenge you this morning to come to understand that God wants you to utilize the word in prayer. But he doesn't want you to use it as a mantra. He wants you to use it in the right way. Why do we need to learn to speak out loud the word of God? Number one, it builds your faith. You know, when you speak out loud the word of God, there's something happens when you speak out loud. You hear yourself speak. And it's almost like an echo. It goes back and forth and starts to build your faith. There's something that happens when you loudly proclaim his promises. It reminds you of God's promises. Hearing it makes it get down into your soul over and over and over. It's got to get down into your soul. Number two, it strengthens your spiritual foundation. You must know the word of God because that is the foundation. It builds your life upon him. God wants you to use his word but it, and strengthen it. It gives you authority when you have that word deep. Number three, it humbles you because you're not asking for what you're praying for in your strength, but you're asking according to his will and you're submitted to God and to his purpose. The apostle Paul had an affliction and he said, I, three times I prayed and asked God to take that away from me. He said, that was my will. But God said to me, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm not taking it away. You're going to live with this. So Paul said, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities. Why? Because this is the will of God concerning me. I'm not in a battle to fight the enemy over this struggle physically that's happening in my life, but I understand after I've been to God that he has this for a divine purpose in my life. It humbles you. It humbles you because all of a sudden you're reminded that God is the one that's in charge and you're not. I've heard people use the word to, 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 try, to try to have their way and that's not what God wants. It also for it declares your position in God against Satan. Satan will test you. As I said to you, that one in the book of Acts who was trying to cast out the devil, Satan, or the, the devil says to him, he said, Paul I know and Jesus I know, but who are you? I remember one time I was with my father-in-law. He was a pastor in Richland, Washington. And we had a young boy, and I know that a lot of people don't necessarily believe this, but you come with me, with me to India and you'll learn, soon become a believer. This young boy was demon-possessed. Terrible. We were praying for him. We prayed for him for about four hours. I was a young, I hadn't even graduated from college yet. I was just in my final year of college and I was just a young preacher, young youth pastor. And this boy was more than I could handle. So my father-in-law and I prayed for him. We prayed for him for about six hours. And this boy's countenance would change and you'd feel this evil spirit speak out. And I remember one time as you know, during that time, I looked, I looked at him and I said, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of him. And that boy turned to me and his eyes turned to fire and he said, who are you? <laughs> I thought, oh God, have mercy on me at this moment. Who are you? I said, well, I'm a servant of God, a born 
washed in the blood, that's who I am. He said, oh. <laughs> I thought, whew, I passed that test okay. But you have to be careful how you use the word, but it declares your position against Satan. Paul says there are two things in the armor of God that are defensive. One is the word, and the other is praying in the spirit in all occasions with all kinds of prayer requests that you will be praying for all of the Lord's people, it says. And number four, or number five, it gives you power over the enemy. Victory to victory. I was pastoring in Puyallup, Washington. I'd been there about two years and our church was struck by lightning and burned to the ground. Devastating. I had a congregation of about eight or 900 people at that time and had to rebuild and had to figure out what to do instantly and what to happen and where to get contractors and how to, how to get this thing done. I had one architect say, well, it's gonna take me about 18 months to draw drawings. I said, you're fired. I'm not interested in you. I need something right away. And I had another contractor that joined me. He said, I can get it up in a year. And I said, you're hired. And I remember the foundations of the new building were being laid and it was a Sunday afternoon. And I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, come meet me out on the grounds. And I went out to the grounds and I stood there as the foundations, the, blo the block walls were just about coming up. And I felt the power of the enemy there. He said to me, I will destroy you. And I said, no, you won't. Get thee behind me, Satan. I said, you have no authority, no power here. I am the appointed pastor of this church and I am the authority that God has put here and I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And when that new building was over, we tripled in size and God turned that community all around. Why? Because the enemy's gonna try to intimidate you. He's gonna try to say to you, you know what? Uh, you don't have any power, yes. But as you walk with God, and you get his word into your life and into your heart, down deep into your soul, you begin to gain authority. Not for your purposes, but for his purposes. And so you can declare, and I challenge you today to get into the word and begin to find his promises for you. But you can stand on him. Like I am the Lord that healeth thee. Don't keep it here, let it get down here so that you have, a, you have an authority to speak it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When he comes to you to, cut, to, to, to hinder you, you start to use the word against him. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. Yes, I might have fallen, but old things are passing away. New things are beginning to happen in my life. Nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. And Paul lists all the things that, that, that are there and nothing can separate you. Trust in the Lord and he shall direct your paths. Keep your trust in him. And when, he, when you come to that Y of the road, you have to trust him. And if he doesn't say anything, say, okay, God, I'm going this way and you direct me. And if it's the wrong direction, he'll tell you and you'll go the other direction. But trust in his direction. Believe that he says, I am the Lord, your provider. Jehovah Jireh. I wanna tell you something. If you're unemployed right at this point in time, you're not. You are never unemployed as a child of God because all that ever happens is God, and while you're employed, God gives you your boss to give you his money. And when, you, when he's done with it, God has other ways of bringing it to you because God says, I am Jehovah Jireh. Get those words down in your heart. My challenge to you is search the word and get his promises. Now, tie that word that God gives you with the intercessory prayer as you pray for these people. If you're here today and you've overcome depression, you have an authority to deal with people that are depressed. You pray the word of God over them. If you're here today and, and you see people that are hurting and looking for a job, you have the authority because God is your provider and you can pray over these things. And take the authority of God's word and pray over every one of these. Use the word of God. Paul says, take the helmet of the salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, 
and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for the Lord's people. So I challenge you, let's pray for the Lord's people today and let's have victory today. Shall we stand? Let's stand. Father, I thank you. We're going to pray today, and we thank you that the victory is ours through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is not in our strength. It is in your strength. It is in your word. It is by your power. And today we speak the word because, Lord, when we speak it, that's when it becomes reality. There's power in that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go to prayer, and I'll be back in a few minutes to, to join us as we close.
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything
your mercy never fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, there's nothing better than you. 
We praise the Lord for his goodness and his provision. We're going to take communion in just a moment. But just before we do, I just want to give a word of encouragement. He's holy. He's bought our victory. He's paid for our sins. He has also provided for our healing by the broken body of Jesus. I just happened a few minutes ago, it happens to be where I'm reading right now, but in Psalm chapter three, I have, I write in my Bible. I don't know about you, people say you desecrate it. Oh no, I write in it. I have on Psalm, uh, excuse me, Psalm chapter three, September 19th, 2012. Don and Janice Shesky were living in Springfield. Nancy and I were living here. Our son John called us. He is, you know, it's one of these ancestral relationships. It's brother and sister married to brother and sister. So Darren's sister is married to my son, Erica. Was deathly sick. Took her to St. Vincent over here. 
and they said, call your family. She's not gonna make it. I'll never forget that day. Those are the times you grab a hold of the throne of grace and you ask God for a word, and this is what he gave me. But you, O Lord, are a shield around her, my glory and the one who lifts her head high. I cried out to the Lord and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept, I woke up in safety for the Lord was watching over me. They put, took her to intensive care and community and I think it was in three or four days she was out of the hospital and healed and has been healthy ever since. I say this to you before we take communion because Jesus paid for our victory and our health and our strength and everything. And you need to grab a hold of the Word of God and say, God, I stand upon it. Doesn't necessarily mean it'll always work out the way you want it. That's a fine. If it doesn't, then I know that he's still in control. But he wants us to intercede and pray. His body was broken that we may be made whole. We hold in our hands the bread. It's a symbol of his body. He said, unless you eat my body and drink my flesh, you will not have a part of me. I'm so happy that I have the privilege to eat the bread and all that it means. His brokenness was fine for our wholeness. Shall we partake together? And his blood was shed for our forgiveness. Not only the past sins, the present sins, the future sins. We have been adopted into the family. So Lord, we take this cup, we take this bread, all as a symbol of what you've done and paid for, for us. And we drink the cup now in the wonderful name of Jesus, shall we partake? And we come to you today, Lord, and we pray. We pray, Lord, for every request that has been laid out here on these altars. No matter what these people are facing, you are working your plan and will out for their lives and we are interceding for them. We are insisting on heaven's best in their life and not hell's worst. We're saying, oh God, if they want to need healing, you are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. And so we come to you and ask that you would bring them healing. We say, Lord, for those that, and I've read several that need a job, you are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that provides. And God, may they learn to trust your provision. You will provide for them abundantly. Oh Lord, you are with them. Your strength is their shield. For those that are struggling, oh God, may your strength and shield come around them and may they know that you are the one that cares for them. For those that are searching, we pray that the Holy Spirit would do his gentle drawing in their life. And may they come to know the wonderful love of Jesus and what he means and what he can mean to them. For those that are seeking the way, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. Your Holy Spirit works with us along with the word and says, turn to the left, turn to the right, do this, do that. And God, we bring ourselves in submission to you to say, Lord, we want your will in our lives above everything else. We ask, oh God, that that would happen in the lives of these people, these requests that are here. Thank you, Father. As we pause today, we pray for the chaos in our world. And we're reminded that it was chaos in this world 
upon which the Spirit of God moved and you said you spoke and creation happened. So we come to you today and we ask that you would correct the wrongs in this world today, that you would bring peace, peace in the middle of this chaos, that your purposes would be accomplished and that you would reach and save and protect people, oh Lord, that's so desperately needed in today's world. We pray for our nation, oh God. I pray, oh God, that you would bring revival to this nation. As we intercede, oh God, it is not our vote that matters. It is your will that matters in our lives. It is your direction that matters. Oh God, I pray that you would bring revival to this nation, that we would become a people that would seek after you. Oh Lord, it seems like every evil has come upon us and in the name of Jesus, we stand against them as Christians, as believers, as blood-bought people and say, oh God, let your kingdom come on earth even as it is in heaven without resistance, without any kind of stoppage. May your will be done in our lives and through our lives. We pray, oh God, for our neighbors and our friends people that we have relationship with that do not know you. Oh God, guide our steps and guide our conversation. May your love flow through our lives to them. May we love them and by the love that we share, may they see Jesus in us and may there be a piqued interest to come to know Christ as their Savior. Oh God, I thank you for all the people that are making the commitment, and I pray for the services tomorrow. The Lord, as people gather into this sanctuary, may the Holy Spirit have free reign, that you would have the, uh, uh, the, the open door to speak to hearts and touch lives. Draw even now people here for services tomorrow that need to know you, and may they come to that relationship, oh God. I thank you, Lord for this church and what it stands for. And I thank you for the lighthouse that it is in this community. As they go through all of the dream team activities and caring for community, Lord, may they be blessed. Oh, Father, we thank you that there are so many ministries that are touching lives and people who are hurting, who are hungry, who are homeless, who are caught in sex slavery. All of those, oh God, we pray for all of those ministries that are going on as an extension of this church. Oh God, let your anointing bless those people that lead them. And Lord, may they see a harvest of souls, we pray, in those ministries. We thank you, Lord, for all of your blessings. And we pray for our individual families. I know that there are people here, Lord, that are, have children that are away from you. But Holy Spirit, you are the one that can reach out to wherever they are. And we ask that in your gentle and special way that you would reach out and touch their hearts and draw them close to you. And Lord, may they come to that relationship with you. May that family be united as one in Christ that they have always prayed for. We pray for those wayward children, especially teens, God, that have gone their way. We bind the power of Satan in the name of Jesus and pray, oh God, that you would release your power in their lives and may they come to see you as Lord and Savior. We praise you for all those teens that are coming to you and we pray your blessing and strength over their lives, oh God. And we thank you for all the special little children. Oh God, they're so special. Bless them abundantly as we look into their eyes and see their, their simple childlike faith and trust. Oh God, bless them. Bless them. And bless those in our departments that lead these children. Give them words of wisdom. Give them words of love. And may these children grow up to be great servants of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We just honor your holy name and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Thank you. God bless each one of you.